Okay. Um, so, just with respect to what you guys have done, um, this last lab was essentially a, a taste or a flavor of, of what's going on with. Um, actually, could you guys be quiet? So the idea was to, to try and assess, um, or for you guys to have an opportunity to use different metabolomic software tools. Ideally, we would have liked to have had you guys try the XCMS system because this gives you an opportunity to, to try what probably the most of you do is, is in terms of untargeted LCMS. But what we really wanted to show as well is that, there, that for many of you, there are alternative techniques, NMR, GCMS, which are quite powerful which are quite automatable, uh, which are quite fast. Now, some of the difficulties you guys have had because we just hit these servers probably harder than they've ever been hit before with 25 or whatever going on it. So, but on a normal day, uh, at a normal time, um, these things would typically respond in, in, in a minute or less and, and get you really, I think, useful data. And it's quantitative data. And one of the points I really want to make here, and I think a take-home message, if this is, this is the only take-home message you get, is that whether you're looking at humans or rats or mice or plants or microbes, within a given species or even within a given genus or, or phylum, metabolism is very, very highly conserved. And it's unlikely that you are necessarily going to find completely novel compounds uh, as part of a metabolomics experiment. Where things differ is primarily in their concentrations. And that's okay if you're actually just measuring differences in concentrations between cohort A and cohort B or sample X and sample Y. The, uh, fundamentally, most medical diagnoses, as an example, are on the basis of concentrations. It's not, is the compound here and not seen elsewhere. In fact, the compound is always there. It's just, is it way too high or way too low? So you can think of it as a, as a ternary index, high, medium, or average, or low. So if just in that qualitative state, if you're measuring 100 metabolites, you have 3 to the 100 possibilities to define a phenotype, a disease, a condition, whatever. That's a big, big number. So only working with 100 metabolites and knowing whether it's too high, too low, or average gives you tremendous diagnostic, prognostic, phenotypic power. Now, in many other fields, we don't have an idea of what high, medium, and low is. But in metabolomics, certainly with humans, for many mammals, even for a lot of plants, and for many microbes, we do. We know what those values are. So this gets back to the point of if we've got good quantitation, if we focus on getting those concentrations, you can do a lot. You can publish a lot. You can patent a lot. Um, you can explain a lot. And all of those things are, are what we try to do either in science or in science industry. So even though by you know, shrinking down to the small-ish number of compounds that GCMS and NMR provide, it still gives you an awful lot of information. Now, LCMS, obviously, the advantage and the appeal is that you're measuring potentially thousands of features. Um, but you're not getting absolute concentrations. And in many cases, we don't know what the features are. So I, I think, as I say, be happy if you can get some concentrations. Strive to get some concentration data. And don't be afraid to just work on targeted studies. Now, the other thing we wanted to highlight in, in this exercise was um, the idea of complementarity. 
that using three platforms instead of one platform is helpful. And what you get in one platform can inform what you should see in another platform. So if you're seeing a whole bunch of compounds by NMR, you should probably see a lot of the same compounds in GCMS. And if you aren't, then there's something wrong with your library or something wrong with your method. Same sort of thing if you've got very high abundant compounds in an LCMS study, but you can't see them by NMR. Or you're seeing things by NMR, but you're not seeing them in LCMS. Something's wrong with your library or protocol. And so these are things where by looking at what you get from multiple platforms, you can A, understand shortcomings with your sample preparation, and B, also get broader coverage. Because there are some things that you won't be able to see just because of the chromatography step or the isolation step or the separation step. Um, but if, if you're not doing any chromatography or any separation, you know, it's direct injection mass spec or direct injection NMR or direct injection GC, you should see these same sorts of things. So that's another thing to remember and, and another point. The third thing I wanted to bring up with this exercise um, was the possibility of automation. So you guys are trying some of the very first automated tools for metabolomics. Um, now, they weren't perfect, uh, unfortunately, but um, they're getting better. And I think you're going to see more of this happening. And if there are some of you who like coding or want to do that, this is something you could think about. It's how do I make it better? How do I make it faster? What are some of the other things? Because every field... Um, in analytical chemistry or even general biochemistry and microbiology trends towards making it simpler, faster, and easier. And with computers, now you can say automatic. So as scientists, we tend to revel in the idea of, you know, I want to spend six months of my life figuring out compounds and processing data. And it's fun, at least for the first time. If you have to do it two and three and four more times, then it gets really, really boring. And so the idea here is if we can automate it, then, yeah, you can quickly move through to the next phase, which is what we're going to talk about mostly tomorrow and why we wanted you guys to at least run through the exercise to get your data sets. And later this, at, this evening or afternoon, you'll be able to try and get a more complete set. We'll have other data sets that you can use um, to, to try out uh, Metaboanalyst. Now... Anne mentioned the Metaboanalyst um, material on GitHub. So these are, I think it's about 200 pages. Um, and this is a, a very, very complete um, tutorial. So you can download it, um, but my own recommendation might be to have one, two, three, four, five, five printed copies that people could kind of split and share. It's a lot to print, um, but um, it will eventually show up in a, a current protocols chapter, but you guys have a special preview uh, of the full set. And Jeff spent a couple months of his life, and I spent about a month of my life just trying to put that together. So I think it's, it's, it's really useful, and you'll find it quite useful for tomorrow's application. So perhaps you could take a look through it and make a decision about and, and let Ann know if, if you guys would like a, a printed copy. Okay, so that's a preamble. I'm going to dive into um, databases. Um, and this is important. We've seen software. Now we're going to talk about databases. And often the two are integrated for metabolomics. Uh, we're going to talk about how databases have evolved in the field of, of metabolomics and in bioinformatics. We're going to look at some of the different types of metabolomic databases. I've talked a little bit about them. Talk about some of the different NMR and MS databases. We'll also talk about pathway databases and another thing we call called comprehensive metabolomic databases, which are a little different. So historically, the first um, informatics field to emerge in biochemistry, if you want, was actually chem informatics. It's a much older field than bioinformatics. And for a long time, the two basically moved in separate universes. So in the case of cheminformatics, the first tools, the first software started appearing in the 1960s. 
a lot of it was designed specifically for organic chemists. And in the 60s, the model for software was a for-profit model. Companies, organizations, um, casts, and the American Chemical Society is an example, were established and made hundreds of millions of dollars by developing software and or databases that they sold to pharmaceutical companies, chemical manufacturers, libraries, and so on. They're large um, companies still, MDL, Bill Stein, Sigma. These, these were established purely for cheminformatics and, and databases. Bioinformatics, which you guys have mostly come from, was really started in the late 80s, early 90s. It was designed for molecular biologists, and it emerged at the time when the internet was emerging. So people pushed for a web-based model, open access, free software. Uh, there were, and there still are, but in the early days there were quite a few bioinformatics companies. They all went belly up, uh, largely because of this free model, and largely because your tax dollars have been subsidizing this, um, whether it's through NCBI or EBI or NIH. Uh, interestingly, Canada puts nothing into it, <laughs> um, and we largely benefit from the, the largesse and generosity of, of American taxpayers or European taxpayers. Um, GenBank is permanently funded by an act of Congress in the U.S. So it will only disappear if the U.S. disappears. Um, most other databases um, are um, largely done through grant to grant. So one of the earliest databases, PDB, Protein Data Bank, uh, they have to apply for funding basically every year. They have teams of people applying for dozens of grants just to keep it going for you. Uh, so it, it's insane, actually, that something that important is basically on a, on a, on a threadbare rope um, to stay going. So what do you do for databases? Really, databases were evolved um, to help consolidate data. And when they became computer databases, they helped with linking. With linkage comes faster retrieval, faster querying. Many databases are also homes to get reference values and reference images, reference data, reference sequences. So same with GenBank and PDB, some of the clinical chemistry databases. People use a lot of these databases to train algorithms. It's how the spectral tools and spectral prediction tools are, are trained. It's how chemical comparison algorithms are trained. It's how um, many other things in, in cheminformatics are developed. Similarity searching is a new phenomenon because before it used to be exact matching, but now it's similarity. So this is how you can look for similar images on Google Images, and you can look for similar structures and similar sequences with BLAST or, or other other tools, and now you've got spectral similarity searches. And you guys saw how that works. And then obviously through databases we can do things like prediction because we have been able to train algorithms. So databases are fundamental and sort of like that pyramid of life. Databases lie at the base and everything above that relates to algorithms um, that, that use those databases. So they're extremely important and um, they're also hard to make. Typically databases start off as a, a hobby because someone realizes this just isn't working, I'll gather a little set and see if it, it um, helps the field. So that's how we started Drug Bank. It was a hobby project for a summer student. It's how we started HMDB, sort of a hobby project. First versions are typically flat files kept on Excel spreadsheets. Um, but then you start realizing people want the data, so you start making it a little more uh, accessible. Uh, you might make it a relational database so people can query it. You start archiving it, you start putting it on the web. Uh, you start adding more information because people want it. Most databases end there. Uh, there's a few others, GenBank, PDB being examples, which are archival open deposition databases. So these literally have to have teams of hundreds of people that maintain and support the archival process. 
So if you ever deposited anything, so metabolites, has anyone ever deposited data in metabolites? Has anyone? Okay, well, we'll have to have you guys do all of that. That's the current metabolomics database. Has anyone deposited data in GenBank? Okay, great. Any data in PDB? Okay. So these are, again, archival databases, but require literally millions of dollars a year just to support that, that deposition process. So as you go down, the, I guess the size uh, or the style of database, you increase the, the size of the community. So the, the open archive databases are the most heavily used. The curated ones are somewhat less used. But that's where most databases end up being. Um, as you evolve from the hobby database to the fully open access archival databases, you have to push towards standardization. You have to have increased automation. Um, you have to improve the querying capabilities. And then you also have to spend more money on curators to help ensure that the data is high quality. So we talked about this, or we've seen this slide before, and this was this issue of how do you um, proceed from the raw data to get actual answers. You guys saw examples of tools like Bazel and GC Autofit, which are maybe the equivalent to Mascot or, or, or some of the other tools, but underlying every one of those tools is a database. Underlying Bazel is a collection of 200 spectra. Underlying GC Autofit is a collection of 200 or 150 mm -hmm. spectra. Um, any deconvolution software, any kind of semi-automatic or automatic tool will, will depend on some kind of database. One of the challenges when we started in the field of metabolomics before it had a name, um, which was, I guess, in 2000, or 1999, um, most of the data was in textbooks. And most of the data still is. Um, certainly in print journals, people have been doing analytical chemistry of biofluids uh, for 100 years now. There's 75 years of classic biochemistry, which is incredibly rich, but completely ignored uh, because you can't find it on PubMed. Um, in terms of moving that data, into electronic records and into databases, we are still about 20 years behind proteomics and genomics. The other challenge I think that's not appreciated is in fact uh, metabolomics has a role in many different communities. So some of you, most of you might label yourselves as metabolomics researchers, but there are also people who are pure analytical chemists and they just want to improve the analytical technology. There are people who are plant chemists and are natural product chemists, and they're very interested in, in, in natural product characterization. Uh, drug researchers have a totally different perspective on metabolites and metabolism and the types of information they want to see in a database. Clinical chemists have a totally opposite view sometimes. Um, there are people who use different techniques. So some people who are NMR people want NMR spectra. Uh, not mass spectra. Others who are MS specialists want MS data, but not NMR. And all of these communities are having very, very different demands. And within the bioinformatics community, you're also having people who want to see it structured in very, very different ways with very different or required standards. So you get pulled in many directions. The result is that there are many types of databases in metabolomics. There are the spectral databases, the NMR spectral databases, the MS and MS, MS, tandem MS, EIMS. There are compound databases, some of which we've already talked about. But then bringing a lot of the you know, lists uh, together are the pathway databases, which connect chemicals to genes and to proteins and to physiology and to the rest of biology. And then what we call a comprehensive metabolomic databases, which try and combine all of the elements of the spectral databases with the pathway databases, with the compound databases, with sort of encyclopedias. And so those are, are I guess, a rarer breed, but we'll talk about those. So I'll talk about first the NMR spectral databases. Um, there are several. 
Um, Basil is one that has its own spectral database, but there are others that were established uh, in, in Japan, the SBDS uh, or SDBS spectral database of Japan. Uh, there's another one called NMR Shift DB, and then uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison maintains two different uh, NMR spectral databases. So SDBS has been around forever. Uh, it's produced by the Japanese Institute for Standards, uh, AST, um, and it has quite a number of spectra, uh, MS spectra as well as NMR spectra, as well as FTIR, and there's a variety of search tools. Um, somewhat like the NIST uh, database, which you can buy, um, most of the compounds aren't metabolites. These are essentially hazardous compounds or uh, items of, of sort of you know, industrial interest. Now, obviously, some can end up in humans, uh, but they're just not likely to be found in most metabolomic studies. There's also a limit in what you can download, um, and, and so it's somewhat less accessible than other databases. The Biomag ResBank uh, was originally established to archive NMR data from proteins and other macromolecules, but a number of years ago they shifted to include metabolites, and in fact that became their most popular um, download. So it's sort of like, you know, the PDB established with proteins, they started to put small molecules and suddenly everyone uses the PDB. So this is essentially what happened with Biomag ResBank. So right now they have about 900 uh, metabolites, and they collected quite extensive NMR spectra. Um, they're linked and described in fairly detailed ways. Most of the metabolites they collected were for a plant, Arabidopsis. They have completed the assignments, and they have also converted them uh, to a format, um, NMR star, as well as uh, they're pushing it towards, I think, NMR ML. Uh, the assignments, I think, are quite valuable. Uh, it's a lot of work doing assignments. Another database uh, that was originally started by Chris Steinbeck, who is heading the Metabolomics Initiative at EBI, um, is called NMR Shift DB. He started it and then has moved on, but the database itself has continued, and there are now over 50,000 spectra um, from 40,000 plus structures. So it's quite a bit larger than the Biomag ResBank. But again, probably only 1% to 2% of these compounds are actually metabolites that will ever be found in, in a natural environment. The other 98% have never left the lab. The other issue with the NMR Shift DB, and it is, it is a tool that allows you to predict NMR spectra. Uh, so you, you can actually upload a compound and it will predict your NMR spectra for free. Um, but most of these were collected in chloroform um, or deuterated chloroform and so most metabolites actually of interest are things that are dissolved in water and so there's a very very different NMR chemical shifts for things in water than in chloroform so what you collect or would use in NMR shift DB you wouldn't be able to use in most NMR metabolomics experiments I mention it partly because it still is a large resource, and it is a resource that allows people to help with assignments, and because it has that chemical shift prediction tool, potentially gives you some, some guidance. MMCD is this database, again, developed at, at uh, Wisconsin. They've collected a lot of the NMR spectra that they had from the Biomag ResBank, but they also supplemented it with a lot of mass spec data. Um, so there's about 2,000 metabolites where there's mass spec data in this database. Not well known, but it is you know, a resource that you can potentially retrieve or supplement or create your own library. You can search by peaks and chemical shifts. You can look by for chemical formulas and names and synonyms. Uh, information about the species, where the metabolite was found, and references and links to, to images. So those are the NMR databases. We don't have too many NMR people, but hopefully after today you guys might be convinced that NMR is actually a worthwhile tool. Mass spec. Um, again, I think we've already talked about NIST. Uh, we've talked about Metlin, MassBank, and the GOMDB. The list is growing, and in fact, um, Mona has, has become a very popular resource. The GOM database is one of the original 
uh, metabolomics mass spectral databases. Um, it includes MS data as well as retention index data. It also includes mass spec tags, or MSTs. So they have both identified metabolites as well as uh, unidentified but consistently observed compounds where they have the spectra. Um, so they've right now about 1,500 identified metabolites. Um, they are compatible with NIST and AMDIS, so you can upload them into your NIST and AMDIS sites. Um, the focus with GOLM and with the people who developed GOLM has been primarily on plant metabolites. Um, this is just a screenshot of the GOLM database um, and the website, a really obscure web address. But um, anyways, you can search through it, um, and they are making periodic improvements to the database. In the early days, it was really hard to work with, but um, I think they've gotten much better tools. Um, one of the things to remind you about, and I talked about this a little bit before, is, is the current state of spectral databases, especially with LCMS. This lists, as of, I guess, about eight months ago, the number of spectra that were in these different databases. So I've mentioned Mona. You guys know about Metlin. There are several others, uh, MZ Cloud. I've mentioned NIST and MassBank. The commercial ones, uh, Wiley. There's another couple of free ones like Respect and GNPS. So when you look at the spectra, the number of spectra, it's really impressive. Uh, MZ Cloud has 400,000 spectra. Uh, Mona, 236,000. NIST, uh, 230, 250,000 spectra. And then when you look at the number of compounds, uh, it's not so impressive. Uh, what's basically happening is that there's you know 20 different models of mass specs out there, and everyone's collecting the same mass spectrum on the same compounds and reporting it 20 different times, and sometimes at three or four different collision energies. So it's easy to get from one compound to about 30 to 50 spectra for that same compound. So the net result is that when you try and merge all the compounds that are really in these databases, there's about 20,000, even though it adds up to about a million spectra. So there's essentially a 50-fold redundancy in, in spectral. Um, and when you think about the number of, therefore, unique compounds, it's really tiny. And many of these things are all over the place. So, you know, there's natural products, most of which you won't find in mammals, but you might find in plants. Lots of poisons, something you won't find in plants, but you might find in certain mammals. Um, a large number of compounds, for instance, in, in Metlin, 8,000 of them are peptides. Um, so the, the, the true number of small molecules in Metlin is about four or 5,000. Mona, uh, they list 69,000. Um, 60,000 of those are lipids, which have theoretical spectra. So Metlin has, has updated. They've just started grabbing everything um, in terms of, of compounds. So the latest version now lists like 240,000 compounds from every organism, every system, every industry. So it's, it's, a, it's a large collection of chemicals, but it's not distributed according to species. Uh, a lot of spectra, um, they have collected about 13,000 compounds with high-resolution MS-MS. Anyways, Metlin still has some really high quality uh, MS TOF spectra, and, and it still probably is the go-to place to get referential MS spectra. And it allows you to do a lot of searches. Um, you can enter masses, positive and negative charges, neutral. You can select which type of metabolites, which type of adducts you want uh, or want to avoid. And so with these sorts of searches, you can plug away and it will come out with um, 
lists of compounds which match with different degrees of matching. You can also do MSMS -MS searches as well as just the simple parent ion mass searches. It's compatible with many different types of formats from MZXML to MZ data. MassBank um, is another resource that was originally started in Japan. The funding for that was pulled. Um, MassBank then moved to Europe um, and is maintained in Switzerland as a sort of a, a branch of the Norman uh, group. And then it moved to um, UC Davis with MassBank of North America or MONA. Uh, the mass bank concept is great, and in fact, they did a, an amazing job of collecting mass spectra uh, from a large number of different compounds. Again, not all metabolites. Consolidate it from many different countries. And it was really unfortunate when the funding was essentially pulled. So the database is online, but it's not being updated. And so it has a nice web interface. It allows you to do a variety of peak searches. And you can retrieve spectral data from that. Um, a lot of that concept is now in MONA and also in the in this European version of, of MassBank. So those are examples of spectral databases. Um, haven't covered every one uh, that there is, and there are some that are merging. But I think there's also caveats about some are just simply compound databases, others are actually truly designed to be uh, metabolite databases. Some contain excellent search tools, some not. Um, so the quality varies a fair bit, um, but um, I tried to highlight, I think, some of the better ones. Compound databases, we've talked about PubChem, we've talked about Kebby, we've talked about ChemSpider, Ligand Expo is what the Protein Data Bank has spun off in terms of its small uh, molecules. How many people use Kebby? Okay, not many. Um, anyways, it's up to about 45,000 compounds, um, and it's growing probably about um, maybe 1,000 compounds every two months or so. A lot of the compounds are pulled from other databases, so they with, got a lot from KEG and from Lipid Maps and Drug Bank. The original focus of Kebby was on, on ontology and naming. Um, but they've expanded it to include Wikipedia entries to describe things. It's searchable by names and formula. It is about compounds that are biologically interesting. So it covers everything, every domain of life science. Um, so it could be in the area of toxicology, exotic, uh, strange mushroom compounds, it could be strange sponges and things like that. All those compounds will end up there. So again, it's not organism specific or domain specific, um, but it does support um, searches. <coughs> PubChem, uh, they had a massive update in December, and I probably should have updated it, but so it's up to 83 million compounds, and I think it's about 120 million substances. Um, there's a restriction that you have to have less than 1,000 atoms. They've taken the data from many, many different groups and consolidated it. Um, the database that's visible is actually apparently only a fraction of all the data they actually have, and they spend a lot of their time negotiating to get some of the data released. Um, I think, how many people have looked at PubChem? Almost everyone. Anyways, it is, I think, a pretty amazing resource in terms of finally releasing a lot of the data that had been hidden uh, and kept hidden by CAS and, and other um, commercial organizations. So this has really helped a, a lot. And they've done a lot more linking over the last couple of years so that it links nicely into uh, PubMed, links to other databases on, on, on bioactivity. Um, and the, the trend is to try and basically be the database that swallows every other database in the NCBI. Um, and they probably will do it in large part because I, I think the higher-ups realize how important uh, chemistry is and how rapidly and widely accessed PubChem is. Uh, it's 
going through the roof in terms of access compared to a lot of other databases NCBI has. Um, ChemSpider, uh, how many people have used or heard of ChemSpider? So this was um, for a long time maintained by a fellow named Anthony Williams. Um, he left a year ago to take over uh, work on the uh, cheminformatics for the EPA. Um, ChemSpider is maintained by the Royal Society, and, and there are things that are visible and things that are not visible or not downloadable. And it was sort of the issues with the Royal Society telling people what they could and couldn't use that led to Tony Williams leaving. As a result, I think it sort of lost a lot of the wind from its sails. But it's still, um, you know, it's still there. It's still got a lot of information. And it's still, I think, quite useful. Um, like PubChem, probably only 1% to 2% of the compounds in it have ever left the lab. So um, it's not obviously the best resource for, for searching um, for, for metabolites. Has anyone heard of Ligand Expo? If someone had, that would have been a first, because I think most people don't know about uh, this resource. But this is very biologically relevant. Every small molecule that is bound to a protein is in Ligand Expo uh, that they have like, solved by NMR crystallography. Therefore, every one of these compounds is biologically relevant. Now, not all of them are going to be found in humans. Some of them represent experimental drugs that have really never left the lab. But um, there's a lot of, of biological information. And this is where it connects the small molecule to the protein. And this is fundamental. How do we integrate proteomics with metabolomics? Well, it's, it's right here. It's in Ligand Expo. And unfortunately, it's, it's not mined. Obviously, no one knows about it. Um, so clearly, it is a useful resource that, that would really help. The other thing, too, is it gives you the three-dimensional structure of these compounds. Most of us are used to looking at two-dimensional structures. And the three-dimensional structure has a lot to do with um, how it looks by NMR, or how it fragments by MS, uh, how it binds to proteins, um, its role or function. There are other kinds of compound databases, some of which you may have heard, some of which you probably haven't heard of. Um, so uh, how many heard of, have heard of 3DMET? How many have heard of Knapsac? Only the plant person. How many people have heard of My Compound ID? All the folks from TMIC. And then how many people have heard of Lipid Maps? A few more. So, so 3D MET is a collection of about 3D structures of about eight or nine thousand natural metabolites. Um, so a smallish number, but it's still a collection of products, natural products. So these are you know useful molecules. Knapsack is an amazing resource. Um, it's a collection of plant metabolites, but linked to species. And again, in metabolomics, we really need that information. Uh, you know, why hunt for compounds that cannot or never will appear in an organism, uh, or you should be looking for compounds that should be in that organism. And so that linkage to species information is, is actually what makes SNAPSAT unique and really valuable. My compound ID is something that um, I'll explain a little bit later, but this is a resource that if you're hunting for unknowns, um, this is the place to go. And lipid maps uh, was established at UCSD, um, it's about 10 years old now, and it's really the major hub for, for lipids. Um, it's no longer expanding. Um, it's been sort of static, but it, it covered a lot and covered a lot of the nomenclature and essentially established the nomenclature for lipids that everyone is now going to be using. So my compound idea is, is um, sort of a multiple resources all piled into one. So it was published, I think, in 2011 initially, and then there have been subsequent publications and updates for it. The neat thing about my compound ID is that um, it takes metabolites and it asks what sort of transformations can they go through. Um, and it identified about 75 transformations or modifications that can occur. 
And what it did was took those modifications and applied them to, at the time, about 8,000 metabolites that were in the HMDB. So then it did this first pass metabolism uh, with the 76 transformations on the starting 8,000. 8, and out of that, um, because of their different modification sites, some have multiple sites and things like that, it generated almost 400,000, um, um, I guess we'll say molecular formulas. And then it did a second pass metabolism starting with 375,000 on the other, uh, using the other 76 transformations. And so you've got almost 11 million molecular formulas. Now, my compound ID doesn't generate structures. It generates M over Z or molecular weights. But that's still adequate for doing mass searches. So it at least can give you, here's the parent compound, and here's the modification X and modification Y. You don't have an actual structure, but this is suggestive of what, what likely combination is there. So website, uh, pretty simple, mycompoundid.org. And uh, the offerings on it are increasing almost monthly um, in terms of the things that you can do. Um, this is just an example of what you can se select and choose, and the sorts of searches, types of reactions that are allowed, supports. And these are the compounds. The interesting thing is that when people have used my compound ID, they can go from a, an identification rate of 5%, 10% among features up to 50%. Now, it's only at the M over Z level, so that's basically a, a level 3 identification. So you want to confirm it with other information. But at least it's giving you a hint of what it could be or what it possibly could be. Okay, so those are some examples of, uh, we've talked about NMR databases, we've talked about some mass spec databases, we've talked about some of the compound databases, and then we've talked about some more specialized databases that offer information that potentially allows you to search short or find, in the case of my compound, the ID unknown compounds, or in the case of NAPSTAT, compounds associated with very specific plant species. I'm going to switch gears, and we're going to talk about pathway databases. And I think um, pathway databases are, are, again, the link between the genome, the proteome, and the metabolome, and physiology. So this is, this is at some level, why metabolomics often sits at, that at the top of that informatics pyramid, pyramid because we know all about these pathway databases. We have to. But talk to someone in the field of genomics or transcriptomics or proteomics, they barely know about KEG. They've never heard of Reactome. They don't know what biopsych or metapsych is. But if you're doing metabolomics, I presume, has everyone heard of KEG? If you haven't, you have to leave the room. Um, <laughs> some of these others are, are less well-known, but uh, Reactome, how many people have heard of or used Reactome? So in fact, it is now part of EBI, but it was actually started um, by Lincoln Stein, uh, who is heading up the, the organization here, and is formerly, I guess, Anne's boss of bosses. And then uh, Biopsych and Metapsych were established by Peter Karp and have been around. How many people have used or seen the, the psych databases? A few of you. And then, have anyone heard of the Small Molecule Pathway Database, or SMPDB? Okay, a few. So, the pathway databases, as I say, relate genes to proteins. Some can relate to disease. Some provide a little bit of information on signaling events and processes. They are visual tools. And this is something that also makes them very appealing. Because if you get tired of looking at spectra, and you get tired of looking at chemical structures. In the case of KEG and Metapsych um, and Reactome, they actually cover multiple species as well. And so this distinction and inclusion of species information is also what makes uh, pathway databases particularly valuable, just like Knapsack makes, makes that information. So of course the best known database, pathway database, is KEG. 
and um, I, I think you know the, the simple wiring diagrams and the, the hyperlinkable information and the fact that it covers so many different species and is very very comprehensive makes it um, I think far and away the most appealing pathway database. The data right now there's about uh, almost 20,000 compounds. Uh, they list 10,000 drugs and uh, I think given that there's only about you know 1,600 approved drugs I don't know where they're getting all their drugs from. Um, how many of these are illegal? Um, but I think a lot of them have to do with um, these are salts or suspected uh, early stage drugs. There's a huge resource on glycans, which I don't know how many people have ever used. And then together with the different collections, it's about 450, 460 pathways. Now, for KEG, you know, complete description of human metabolism, we, are, we represent about 100 pathways, humans. Uh, and then there's exotic microbial metabolism, that represents maybe another... 50 to 100 pathways, plant pathways, maybe 120, I guess. Um, so it's not as if you'll find 460 pathways for humans or mice or 460 pathways for plants. And I think you also have to remember that, that the pathways in KEG are very, very generic. So generic that they can't even depict any cellular locations or subcellular locations. <coughs> So most people I have taught don't know that the citric acid cycle takes place in the mitochondria uh, because KEG doesn't show it as happening that way. And so what's in KEG must be true. So again, this idea of, of where subcellular interactions, metabolism occurs is, is, is not captured or capturable by KEG because it is so generic. Um, the other point, obviously, is you have to be able to know what pathway you're looking at. Is it a human or the generic one? And so again, I'll see people drawing, um, you know, the ascorbic synthesis acid pathway for for um, for humans, and humans can't make it. Or, but it's it's so generic that most other organisms have it. Or the photosynthetic pathway for humans. Um, so again, you have to be careful when you are using or searching keg to have some biological context. Can I ask a question just on that? So if you're doing proteomics, you would look more at you know, your, um, your differential proteins, right? And, and But you're saying more with metabolomics to look at different concentrations of metabolites and then try, but how would you take that enrichment step of them associating them with a specific gene or a protein you would just go with? Cellular, you can't just go straight to go, for example, and, and get their subcellular location. So no, there are very few metabolites that have any kind of go annotation. There's a lot of effort, obviously, in the other databases where people are trying to identify the localization of different metabolites. So HMDB has lots of information on, on localization, either at physiological or subcellular. Um, the in metabolomics, yes, we're interested in concentrations. So obviously, we want to know what, what's there. Um, but because we have information about pathways, we can associate perturbations in abundance either with changes in gene expression or protein expression that enhance expression or production or reduce production of certain metabolites. Um, we can associate pathways with uh, binding events or signaling events, which also allow us to understand what, what's precipitating. So the pathways still allow us to do that interpretation. Um, we can also monitor things like flux mm -hmm. uh, and, and whether things are increasing or bottlenecking and piling up at the back or flowing through too quickly. And again, that allows us to, to again, via pathways, identify where these things, where the blocks might be. Um, so you would, but ideally you could integrate with our other Yeah, so metabolomics really it, it integrates exquisitely with proteomic data. It integrates exquisitely with transcriptomic data. It's being used widely in GWAS data. Metabolomics allows you to do a, a finer phenotyping. So if you have a plant that's drought resistant, okay, that's a phenotype. 
if you look at it metabolically, you can say, oh, this plant is a proline-based drought resistance, and this one is a sarcosine drought resistance. So now, yes, it survived the drought, but these two plants have a fundamentally different mechanism via metabolomics. Okay, what are the genes that regulate sarcosine? What are the genes that regulate proline? What are the proteins involved? What are the pathways? What are the signaling processes that allow this to happen? And why do you use those things? And you get, there's physiological reasons, proline being very, very soluble. Sarcosine also is another one that's a stress response metabolite that's used across kingdoms, actually. So these are things that, that um, anyways, that it's, um, I think this is often where these pathway connections help. And, and because people in metabolomics have to be so aware of the pathways, um, it, it helps them with that integration. Essentially, they're organismal, right? I mean, if yeah. you know the organism, then... Like yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk about the small molecule pathway database, um, partly because uh, it's something that we've been working on for a long time, but it was partly to address the shortfalls that we saw with KIG. So the fact that you don't have a pathway that shows the citric acid cycle happening in the mitochondria, the fact that you can't depict mitochondria, the fact that you can't depict the paraplasmic space in, in microbial cells, the fact that you can't depict organs or other physiological events in metabolism. Um, so we also wanted to, to move away from the pure catabolism, anabolism picture of, of, of metabolism to say, how does how can you use pathways to relate to disease? How can you use pathways to relate to drug action? How do you use pathways to relate to signaling? So currently, this is what SNPDB is. Um, <clears throat> these are focused on human pathways, but they would apply to all mammals. So it has a large number of drug pathways, drug action pathways. It has a large number of disease pathways, many of them reflecting uh, metabolic disorders, of which there are hundreds. Uh, then there's about 200 plus metabolic mm -hmm. pathways, which is actually about twice the number that KEG has. And then there's about 40 other signaling pathways. Ideally, there should be about 4,000 signaling pathways. It's just, it's really hard to find that. And that's where, as I say, I think most of metabolism is about. That's what most of metabolomics is about. What we try to do with SMITDB is try to allow the visualization depiction of cell compartments, organelles, protein locations, tertiary quaternary structures. You can map transcriptomic data, proteomic data, and metabolomic data with these tools. And in essence, the idea is to be able to convert gene and protein or chemical lists into pathways or even disease diagnoses. So this is what a pathway looks like in SMIPDB. So it's a little more colorful than a CAG database, but you can see there's uh, the mitochondria. There's that pink blob up in the corner. There's peroxisomes that are drawn. Um, there are organs uh, that are um, affected uh, by the metabolic problem here, and I think this is PKU, I think. And then it shows the metabolite that's being perturbed with a big star or explosion in the left corner. Um, and then you can see pathways, you can see cofactors, you can see whether they're proteins which are in green, whether they're dimeric, trimeric, tetrameric. Um, so that's what a typical pathway looks like in SMITDB. Every pathway has a description. Um, every protein has a link. Every metabolite has a link. Proteins link to uniprot, the metabolites link to HMDB. Um, it's all browsable, viewable, the same way that Google Maps are viewable or browsable, so you can zoom in. So it has controllers to go left, right, zoom in, zoom out. You can also um, do some metabolite mapping. Um, so you can click on lists of metabolites and sort of turn them on and off to highlight them, turn them red or green produce lists uh, that you feed in. These are the per perturbed lists that you identified in a metabolomics experiment. And it then will list um, or show the pathways that have been modified or, or seem to be affected. 
and then those are highlighted in, in the pathway set. So you can see if that makes sense or if it has something related to that. SMIPDB uh, also allows you to, to map metabolite and gene concentrations, sort of in a qualitative way, so it colors them as dark red, orange, yellow, green, so the red-green coloring scheme. Um, you can turn the background off and on, so especially with something like this where it's very color rich, uh, you can turn the background so it's black and white but still see some of the color schemes. So how do you generate pathways for SMIPDB? So we originally drew them all by hand using um, PowerPoint slides. That didn't work too well. Went through lots of summer students, large <laughs> graveyard of summer students. Um, so we developed a tool called Pathways. So this is an online tool um, that allows you to generate SMIPDB pathways. And we've had one person actually uh, working on this for almost a year. And he's used Pathways to generate many SMIPDB pathways. But he's also generated hundreds of pathways for E. coli, hundreds of pathways for yeast, and hundreds of pathways for Arabidopsis. Um, as a web server, it's sort of like Bazel and other things we've shown you. Uh, it's interactive, uh, but it produces machine-readable pathways. So it's not PowerPoint anymore. So you can save things into Biopacks. You can save it into SBML or SBGN. You can save them as SVG or PNG images. And as you're building your map or pathway, you can you know, zoom around like in Google Maps. It's gone through a few iterations. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to use, but certainly having a few people work on it, um, it's iteratively improved a lot. Um, this is just illustrating how you would sort of build pathways. There's different templates that you can use, and you basically think of reactions. The best way to build a pathway is actually to sketch it out uh, on paper first, and then after that you can start uh, building these things in. But it has a huge database, so if you type in names of proteins, it'll instantly grab the protein, know that it's a dimer or a trimer, it might know the cofactors. Um, it has a huge database of chemicals. If you type in a chemical, it'll instantly draw the structure for you. So you don't have to draw structures. You don't have to look through Uniprot or PubChem or anything like that. All the data is accessible. You just have to provide the appropriate names, and it'll create reactions. You move things around, so if anyone's done some of these palette drawing programs or painting programs. This is largely what you do. And you can position things with different arrows, um, render things in a way. So it's done in a very white background and there's a large collection of things that you can drop and drag. Organs, organelles, um, membranes, other things that, that are all uh, viewable. And if you don't like one way, you can shift another. It's a it's a community drawing process, so you can make your pathways open access so someone can go in. You can't necessarily damage what you've done. They would end up creating yet another one, but they can use what you've done and build on it. Um, so that way your art isn't destroyed, but your art can be built upon. Um, so people can add other information. One of the things that most people always forget, or almost always forget to put in are, are uh, transport processes in pathways. No one ever shows, certainly KEG, any of the, the membrane transport proteins that allow metabolites to get in and out. Um, again, this is just an example of a pathway generated via PathWiz um, and showing these zoom boxes where you can look in um, sort of the endoplasmic reticulum or the mitochondria and the different layers and then linking up in this case to the kidney. Um, it's not ideal for printing. Uh, I mean, you can't obviously read these things. So we've been converting a lot of the pathways um, to, uh, if you'll call them, keg-like maps. So it's trying to make them very compact so that you can print them off. Um, this view is ideal much for, for the same way that Google Maps is more useful, um, allows you to sort of scroll interactively. Anyways, it's one where um, I, I think Pathways enables uh, pathway database creation. And now 
you can propagate these pathways. So if you've drawn it for E. coli, you can propagate it to Pseudomonas or Shigella. If you've drawn it for Arabidopsis, you can propagate that set of pathways to um, spruce trees or whatever. Um, the um, other thing, as I say, is that it, it makes these things machine readable. Uh, and that's been a problem. A lot of the KEG databases are written in a language called KEGML, which only KEG uses. So it's, it's sort of um, um, difficult, I guess, to, to reuse the KEG, KEG resources. But SBML, uh, SBGM, these are all community standards. And so that's what um, SMIPDB and Pathways try to use. So the last part, I guess, we'll talk about are the comprehensive metabolite databases. And these are sometimes multi-species, sometimes they're single species. Uh, some of them contain um, pathway information, some of them contain metabolite information. So KEG is recognized as a pathway database, but in some respects it's also a comprehensive metabolomic database. Um, it doesn't have spectral data, but it, it certainly has a lot of other components. So the definition of a comprehensive metabolite database is A, it has to contain more than a thousand compounds. Generally it has to be organism specific or at least associates information about a metabolite to organisms. Ideally there should be some continuous updating or at least annual updating. And minimally it has to contain two or more pieces of information. A, information about the chemical, and B, the pathway, or chemical, spectral, and biological data, or chemical, pathway, and spectral data, or all four of these combinations. So, a database that, as I say, I don't think you guys have heard of, but let's see, has anyone seen this Metabo lights? Just one. So this is maintained by the EBI, and this is started by Chris Steinbeck. And it is intended to be the gen bank for metabolomics. So if you're collecting raw metabolomic data, this is where you're supposed to put it. You're supposed to deposit it. Many journals are starting to require you to deposit your data into metabolites before you can publish. So you can upload your spectra, you can upload your compounds and compound lists, you can upload your protocols and metadata. The net effect is that with people uploading data, they're starting to get large collections of spectra, large collections of metabolites, associations with specific diseases, and associations with specific organs, tissues, and functions. It is done in the Metabolomic Standard Initiative, so it, it follows the standards that are required. It also compels you to follow the standards, which is also good. It has a tough interface to, to upload. It takes a long time, but there are tools <coughs> that are appearing that make uploading much, much easier. Then there's the collection databases that we've been building for the last um, 10 years. And so I think it's probably worthwhile talking about them because a lot of people use them. Um, the Human Metabolome Database, which was started in 2006. Uh, Drug Bank, uh, which was started in 2005. The Yeast Metabolome Database. Um, the E. coli Metabolome Database. Uh, Phenol Explorer, which is um, a polyphenolic database. Toxic Exposome Database. Food mm -hmm. Database small molecule pathway databases, and then specialized databases on cerebral spinal fluid, serum, urine, saliva, and so on. Most of these databases started in a project called the Human Metabolome Project, which was started in 2005. Um, no one's ever heard of it. Um, everyone's probably heard of the Human Genome Project, but this is um, one that was sponsored by, by Genome Canada. And it allowed us to start working on both assembling these databases, but also um, performing a lot of experiments to analyze um, what's in blood, what's in urine, what's in cerebral spinal fluid and saliva. 
So a lot of experimental work was done to com complement that. What we were required to do when we started the project is we had to make all of our data freely available. And we still have. So we've made the human metabolome database freely available, drug bank, food database, T3DB, and so on, all of them are available. And then a lot of the technologies we've developed have also been freely available, including the things you guys have been using today. When we started in the project, we wrote up uh, a paper a proposal and we said, based on what we could gather in 2004, we figured there are about 690 known compounds in the human body. Boy, were we wrong. Anyways, but this is the complete list of compounds that were available in KEG in human psych. So these are, you know, 10 years of these guys compiling data. And so, okay, that must be how big it is. Seems small to us, but that's all the information. So when we released our first version of the human metabolome database, we found out, you know, how wrong they were. They were off by at least a factor of three or four. Three years later, uh, with more measurements and more literature surveys, we're up to 6,400. By 2013, 37,000. Today, it's about 42,000. And I think in terms of detectability, it's something on the order of between, I don't know, 60 to 100,000 compounds that probably should be detectable. Could be more. Could be a lot more. And then in terms of as improvements happen and as we think about theoretical metabolites, the things that transition or are temporary or at very, very low abundance, we are looking at something on the order of probably close to 2 million. We've seen this picture already, but this is how it breaks down. The human metabolome is composed of many metabolomes. Some of them are endogenous, some of them are exogenous. We eat other metabolomes, so therefore they become part of us. So we are part plant, we are part microbe, we are part mammalian, we are part synthetic chemicals. All of those are in our bodies, our skin, our tissues. Um, and I think that's important to remember, because when we first did this, all the compounds that are listed in keg and human psych were just endogenous metabolites. And as I think we started realizing that we are components of, of what we eat and breathe, um, I think that broader view has, has really changed what our perception of, of the metabolome is. So. Some of the databases I think that are important are obviously the Human Metabolome Database, the Toxic Exposome Database, Drug Bank, and, and the Food Database. So I'll talk about these a little bit more. So HMDB right now is about 42,000. We have about 170 gut microbial metabolites. In reality, there's at least two or 3,000 microbial metabolites in our body. Um, the problem is that those 2,500 or 3,000 are identical to what our body produces. So we can't tell whether they're of microbial origin or of our endogenous origin. So these 170 are the ones that are not made or cannot be made by humans. What we list are the low, medium, and high concentrations of metabolites. So this is why I say concentrations are really important. We link a lot of that to diseases, about 700. Right now we've got about 2200 NMR spectra, 7600 MS spectra, 2000 GCMS spectra. We try to make this a resource, or try to make it a resource that links metabolites to other omics. So you can do sequence searches. So the enzyme or transporter that acts on this metabolite has a sequence. And so you can search for those things, and you can look for similarity and homology. You can search by a spectra. There's lots of browsing, different views that you can look at, lots of pathways, 900 plus now in the database. You can search by molecular formula, molecular weight, but you can also search by structure and structure similarity. Very advanced text search tools, and the whole thing is downloadable. So these are just some screenshots of the HMDB showing some of the spectral viewing tools, the pathway viewing tools. <coughs> molecular browser. On average, there are 100 plus, I think it's more than 102 now, uh, data fields in the HMDB. So it's not just a database. It really is designed to be an encyclopedia. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of words written about each compound. Some of it's in you know, paragraphs. Some of it's in terms of an ontology or taxonomy. Some of it's in terms of physical properties or references. But it's a lot of data. 
It supports general MS searching, just like Metlin. Uh, it also does MSMS searching, and just like using CFMID. It does NMR spectral searching, uh, just like um, MMCD or Biomag Rasbank. It supports structure searching, so you can use an applet, draw something, and look for similar structures via the Tamimoto index. It also has a biofluids database, and so concentration data for many different diseases, um, abnormal, normal, urine, cerebral spinal fluid, blood, saliva, uh, fecal water, goes on and on. And at least 15 different biofluids. Again, this is designed primarily for physicians and clinical chemists. The most popular database we developed is actually a drug database. Um, and the reason why it became so popular is because it was the first to link drugs to their targets. So amazingly, all those drug companies had never tried to do that. And um, the result is they've been using uh, drug bank for a lot of their drug discovery efforts and a lot of drug repurposing efforts. And in fact, it's been quite successful having that information. We didn't really intend it to be that or use for that. Um, we were just trying to track the drug metabolome, and we were just trying to link information about what are the genes and proteins that this drug acts on or is metabolized by. So sometimes, you know, an innocent project turns into something a little bigger than you expect, but it has been uh, an interesting ride. So in this case, we had to deal not only with the needs of people from drugs and metabolomics, we had to deal with, you know, pharmaceutical and medicinal chemists and pharmacologists and pharmacists who wanted to know more about the drug targeting, drug metabolism, mechanisms of action, absorption, distribution, metabolism, pharmacokinetics. So that data is in here. Um, of course, it has a lot of information on drug transporters. It has other information on drug metabolites. Lots of information on drug-drug interactions, drug-food interactions. But like HMDB, it has stuff for searching sequence, text, spectra, masses. You can do structure searches. Um, and not unlike HMDB, has the same sort of tools, hundreds of data fields, um, lots of different viewing tools. You can query by chemistry, you can query by the different categories of drugs, you can search by sequence, you can extract data through very complex MySQL searches, which, which are generated via just pull-down menus, so you don't have to know MySQL as a language. Another one is called the Toxic Exposome Database. And again, this grew out of the work in drugs, because not all drugs are safe. Um, but also the fact that we were seeing and others were seeing all kinds of contaminants in blood and urine, pesticides and herbicides and endocrine disruptors and certain solvents and exposures. And so this also pushed us to develop this particular database. It's smaller than drug bank. It's smaller than HMDB. Uh, it's only got about 3,600 compounds. But like drug bank, it has the targets that these compounds act on. So it explains why they're toxic. It also links a lot of this to gene expression and gene changes. So it's again linking metabolite or chemical to protein to gene and gene expression. And then there are pathways as well. So it, it tries to combine all of these things in a systems view. Question? So is that through curation in the literature or did you guys actually do Well, some of these we found, uh, but you know, there's no point typically trying to do or redo some of the stuff that's been done. Most of it's in the literature. Um, huge amounts that are effort of, made by the CDC and EPA to measure things in people. Um, the NHANES studies cost tens of millions of dollars a year, and they publish the data all the time. But it only covers about 200 compounds. Um, but yeah, there's lots of literature in, in, in what's, what they're finding in very sick people 
as well as healthy people. Um, and uh, um, it's sort of scary, um, but um, it is part of our metabolism. The other one that I think we all ignored or wanted to ignore was the fact that um, what we eat, we, we are what we eat. And, and th this represents a huge part of our metabolome and, and arguably more metabolites in our body are derived from plants than just about anything else. So we are more plant than animal in many respects. And it's just because we're omnivores, we eat plant foods. Um, most of our calories come from plant derivatives. Um, some of it's hard to trace. There's also a lot of food additives, uh, thousands of them, that are, represent the dyes that are in the food, um, preservatives, emulsants or emulsifiers, surfactants. Um, it's, a, it's amazing. Um, so right now, the food database, our uh, food constituent database, uh, lists about 30,000 metabolites. Uh, the average plant minimally contains about 3,000 different metabolites. Uh, obviously, some plants are much more complicated than that. It's just that there's so many varieties um, that sort of leads to that large proliferation of secondary metabolites. Um, this database hasn't been published. Uh, it's sort of um, an underground, virally spread database. Uh, we're still fixing it. Uh, I, we may be fixing it for the next 20 years before it's really ready to publish, but it is quite comprehensive and it's modeled after all the other databases. Some people are working on yeast. Um, the yeast metabolome database um, is, is online, has been for a while. We're doing a massive update. Uh, originally we had, I think, 2,000 some metabolites under different growth substrates. The number this year, I think we're up to 10,000. So the yeast metabolome is pretty big, pretty complex. The other thing to remember is that yeast is important for wine and beer and for bread. And the process of the substrates that yeast grow on produce all kinds of exotic compounds, which technically are part of the yeast metabolome and yeast metabolism. So lots of pathways, lots of um, reactions. We've redone all of the pathways. Um, there are 66 yeast metabolism pathways from KEG. Now we have well over 100 that we've redrawn through SMIPDB and pathways. Um, so it's going to be released later this fall. Um, e. coli metabolism database. Uh, did a very recent update of that. It's much more extensive. Um, large numbers of pathways, um, much more information on reactions. The reason why we focused on the E. coli is that we want to try and link metabolomics to metagenomics in the microbiome. E. coli is the classic microbe. Um, it doesn't cover all of microbial metabolism, but a big chunk of it. And um, we're using E. coli metabolome to extrapolate the metabolomes of many, many other microbes. And this is the idea of this transfer tool, or microbes to metabolites, um, taking the genomic information, taking the pathway, machine-readable pathway information, and just cranking it through one after the other, thousands of, of microbial metabolomes. And that way I think we can start relating the chemistry of the microbiome to the genetics of the microbiome. And really, in the big picture point of view, uh, microbes are just chemical factories. They are there to process um, other foodstuffs and to transform them into either things that are more edible or consumable or better waste products. Um, and I think the challenge of viewing the microbiome as purely a collection of sequences is far too narrow. Many of the sequences are from microbes that are long dead um, or not functional. And you can get a much better functional view of the microbiome by looking at the metabolome. So I think to, to wrap up, um, I guess we're getting close to um, 
And um, it's just sort of a comparison about the different types of databases um, and what each of them have. Um, the comprehensive databases generally check off in terms of, um, you know, having lots of spectra, lots of pathways, lots of structures, lots of descriptions, lots of property and physiological data. So HMDB is an example. Uh, the psych databases and KEG are, are sort of in that realm. And there are others that are, are more associated with sort of compounds or uh, spectral information, others that are more associated purely with pathway. So I've tried to give you a perspective of the different types of databases, but I think that the key message is that in metabolomics, we have very specific needs. And trying to fit your metabolomic need into a database that was developed for a different task or for a different organism will just sort of mean you're chasing your tail. So I think it's important for people to know the organism they're studying try and find the resources that are specific to that organism, or try and create their own resource for that specific organism. I'm very cautious of, and would urge people to be cautious of, of using ChemSpider or PubChem. They're great databases, but they were never designed to be used for metabolomics. And the people who develop them are usually shocked to find that people are using it for metabolomics. I think it's also important to, to understand that there are other tools out there that can help you. Um, and it's not just these you know, comprehensive databases. There's useful information in a number of databases that I've brought up that are somewhat obscure. And I was, again, a little surprised that some people hadn't heard of some of these databases. I think the other message uh, it's really important here is that too often in our interpretation of metabolomic data, we tend to look at it as catabolism and anabolism. We describe our findings in terms of amino acid biosynthesis or our findings in terms of, of um, lipid catabolism. And the, the fact is that, that many, many metabolites play a vital role in signaling, in homeostasis, in disease control, in the immune functions or immune system. And as we start scraping below the surface, I think people are, are realizing how important metabolites are uh, at just about every level and in every disease process. Metabolites emerged or became essentially the first lines of defense for cells about a billion and a half years ago. Metabolites were used to guard against moisture loss, UV radiation damage, attacks from other organisms. Metabolites are your first line of defense in your body. In that regard, they're going to change before anything else, whether it's your white blood cells or your um, other uh, complement systems um, to fight off infections or to fight off viruses or to fight off tumors. I think we're realizing, as an example, in the case of cancer, uh, and we're in the OICR, um, that more and more, the classic genetic disease, cancer, is being recognized as a fundamentally a met metabolic disease. And that almost all the drivers for cancer, as an example, are checkpoints for metabolism. And we're now recognizing that there are oncometabolites metabolites that cause cancer or drive cancer, and the list is growing. The biggest one actually is glucose. Um, and if you look at the data, um, the uh, consumption of glucose or sugar is very closely tied with the frequency of cancer in many societies, and people with glucose control problems, i.e. diabetics, have some of the biggest, highest rates of cancer. 
and some of the most effective control mechanisms for cancer are diabetic drugs. So metformin is sort of the, the new wonder drug for cancer. Statins are the other wonder drug uh, for cancer, and people who are on metformin and statins seem to be almost cancer-free. But this is an example just underlying sort of the epidemiology that people couldn't understand with a realization that in fact cancer um, is far more a metabolic disease than a genetic disease. And the pathways for that aren't anywhere in KEG. They aren't, in most cases, anywhere in textbooks either. And yet there's hundreds of people doing metabolomics and cancer, but very rarely sort of making those connections. I think we're seeing as well the importance of, of metabolites in signaling in most uh, immune and disease responses. Uh, stress responses for plants are classically chemical, but they're mirrored in microbes and they're mirrored in humans. So that conservation is also quite compelling. Uh, when we look at cross-species and cross-kingdoms. So uh, I think there's a lot to be learned in metabolism, and because metabolism or metabolomics and study of chemicals is um, at least this, this conservation between things, makes, I think, um, sort of these broader sweeping statements about how organisms evolve, how organisms defend themselves, uh, a little easier to make. Um, the, the shared metabolomes between humans, mice, and cows is like 99%. The genetic conservation is, you know, 60%. The uh, shared metabolism between yeast and humans is probably 80%, yet the shared conservation at gene and sequence is, is perhaps um, 30%. So, I think those are important things to remember, and again, important lessons can be learned by looking at model systems. So I think those are my parting words for today. I don't know if anyone has questions or comments of what they saw today. You're also welcome to carry on with uh, finishing up some of the exercises, um, and Jeff and I will sit around. Jeff has some comments. Uh, the XCMS on, online is back online, so... Maybe everyone should, should hurry right now while it's still online. It might go <laughs> offline in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> <since it's... laughs> okay, any questions? Yes. So you, you mentioned the microbiome. I don't know if this is the right phrasing of the question. Um, when do the databases have? Let's say an annotation that say that well, this metabolite comes from metabolism of uh, or, or you know, processing of what we eat by the intestinal microbiome that then goes into circulation. Is there any easy way to figure that out? Not really, um, except in some cases by reading. So an example is what we eat. Um, Many plants produce polyphenols, and hippuric acid is something that shows up in urine in great abundance. And hippuric acid, most of it comes from polyphenols. And there are pathways that illustrate how many polyphenols can progress through about three or four transformations to become hippuric acid. There's a database called Phenol Explorer which uh, we maintain, and it has a lot of the polyphenols, but it also has some of the uh, polyphenolic metabolites. And then there's another database that's going to be released, I hope, soon, called Exposome Explorer, which lists uh, a lot of the biotransformations or markers of food consumption. And those often represent biotransformations um, that happen partly from the microbes, sometimes from phase one or phase two, the, the liver activity. 
Um, we're working on a, a software tool called BioTransformer. And the idea, it's not unlike sort of the My Compound ID, but this one is to, it will use machine learning to recognize structures and identify whether they are substrates or not for about 300 different enzymes. And then if it identifies that as a possible substrate, it then identifies where the reactions or reacting points would be, so the sites of metabolism. And then it performs an in silico reaction and generates the structure. And then it can iterate through these things. And this is, we've done a few of these runs, and this is why we come up with this number of about 2 million compounds that, that we think that are metabolically feasible based on what we know of, of endogenous metabolites. And so with that, we can give you the source of the enzyme, the reaction, the starting product, the, the resulting product. But it's, it's not quite ready yet. OK, any other questions? All right, um, it's late in the afternoon. I know people are tired. Um, so we'll take a break for now.